ओके गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन एम डॉक्टर अभिषेक पाटकर I'd like to welcome you all to the Indian Radiologist Presents uh, Radiology Journal Club. Today we will be discussing uh, uh, the article in, uh, as you can see here, it is a review of diagnostic imaging approaches to Parkinson's disease. Uh, so as all of you know, we all have busy schedules and to keep up with uh, the regular advances and changes in guidelines is uh, very difficult. So uh, every month we have... Uh, a consultant and an expert discussing the uh, discussing the new updates in uh, radiology and uh, today we have dr mathusha last month we had uh, dr chaitali and uh, the video is available on youtube in case you missed it she discussed posteromedial uh, corner of the knee uh, next month we have dr achna borka talking about parathyroid uh, parathyroid uh, 4d ct and in August, we have Dr. Amit Chaudhary talking about the advances in onco imaging. All the details and upcoming events are uh, available to see on uh, the Indian Radiologist website. We have the masterclass series, which is running continuously. Our next event is in June, uh, which is the fetal echo, followed by hepatobiliary imaging and onco imaging in August and September. We have uh, CT bus coming up in September and, uh, of course, sono bus in January. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to announce the online edition of the MRI teaching course, which will, be, which will happen on the first weekend of November. We have international speakers uh, covering topics in AI, neuro, body, and MSK imaging from across the world. We have speakers from the US, UK, Singapore, Australia. And of course, you'll have MMC credit points for uh, this event. Uh, so let me introduce our uh, speaker. She is uh, a consultant radiologist in uh, Nanavati Max Super Specialty Hospital. She specializes in PET CT, CT, and uh, MRI. Her special interest is in uh, neuroimaging and radiology advances. She has over 10 years of experience and has delivered more than 50 lectures at national and international conferences. She is a member of the Radiological Society of uh, North America, IRI, yeah. Uh, ESR, uh, Bombay Neurology Association, Cardiovascular, MRI Society, and BIR. She has various honors and awards, and uh, she is a she's a teacher and a co-guide for postgraduate uh, BNB and biomedical engineering students. Her topic for today is Parkinson's imaging, uh, imaging in Parkinson's. Now, if I can ask you to share your screen, please. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. I'll just start my screen share. Uh, thank you all for joining today morning. So, Journal Club, as uh, Abhishek mentioned, it's just an endeavor that we take one article and we go through that updated uh, article together and then we discuss uh, relevant clinical cases based on the same article. So today, uh, the article which we have chosen is a review of diagnostic imaging approaches to assessing Parkinson's disease. So basically, as we know that uh, imaging has been uh, playing important roles in not only conditions like brain tumors and stroke, but it has evolved drastically. And uh, today, like disorders like dementia and movement disorders also need brain imaging in some form, not only to exclude other diagnoses, but also in order to come to a conclusive diagnosis in these spectrums. So Parkinson's and movement disorder spectrum dis uh, diseases are something which do require a diagnostic imaging approaches. And there are multiple articles which are available on net. These are updated articles. And one of them, them a good one, is this article which I have chosen. And this is a very recent article of uh, 2022. So it goes through the clinical manifestations of Parkinson's disorder as well as the related Parkinsonian syndromes. And then it tells us how to differentiate between these clinically as well as role of imaging in differentiating between these. 
Beyond what we have today in our routine practice as MR and nuclear studies, it also discusses about the future role of uh, sequences like DTI and sequences like magnetization transfer in assessing these disorders. So let's go through the article. Parkinson's disorder is a pervasive, chronic, progressively debilitating neurodegenerative disorder that commonly presents with a series of motor-related symptoms. So that we all know, including resting tremors, stiffness, bradykinesia, and issues with balance and reflexes leading to postural instability and impaired gait. So basically, uh, when the patient is with us, we know that some kind of bradykinesia, a very brief history, what as a radiologist we take, is of some kind of tremors, bradykinesia, issues related to balance. But most of these patients will have a proper uh, prescription with them if they are coming for movement disorder spectrum imaging or Parkinson's protocol now as they call it. Uh, some neurologist who is keen into movement disorders must have examined these patients in most of the cases. And you have to say the prescription in details because they give some clinical details which are relevant not only for them, but for us also to correlate as per our MRI findings. Because unlike routine, what we do for brain tumors, it's radiology driven and we give them the correct diagnosis. They may just think that there is some mass in the brain or features are like raised intracranial pressure, but they might not understand what exactly is going inside. So in those case scenarios, we give them the diagnosis. It's like a glioma, it's a meningioma, etc. But these are the disorders where we are going to face our diagnosis in relation to their clinical findings. Whether if we are calling a person as PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy, then are there clinical features to call this patient as PSP? That is really important because labeling these patients with uh, Parkinson's or Parkinsonian syndrome can make drastic change in their treatment as well as the prognosis as well. Because uh, we see go, while going through this article that PSP, MSA, etc., they have relatively poorer prognosis, poorer response to their routine treatment for Parkinson's. And the degree of worsening also is quite rapid in these disorders. So better to correlate clinically before labeling anything based just on the MRI or imaging findings. So let's go through this article. So PD was first officially characterized in 1817 long back by British surgeon James Parkinson and later distinguished from other tremor-related movement disorders such as multiple sclerosis by a French neurologist, Jean Martin Chaffort. Not going through the details of uh, uh, the way it will present, but medical imaging techniques such as MRI, PET-CT and SPECT, which is their gamma cameras, can be used to safely and non-invasively acquire quantitative measures of neurological health. And depending on the modality and how it is used, these technologies can provide information related to changes in the brain that are pathognomonic of PD throughout its progression. So not only diagnosis, but also for follow-up. Now, what are the clinical features of Parkinson's? All of us already know bradykinesia. Once uh, Parkinson's comes into picture, three, four words are there, tremors, bradykinesia, imbalance. But something this article highlights is the earliest indicators of disease are the non-motor related symptoms. So this is something which we might miss. So non-motor related symptom can be earliest presentation of Parkinson's. That can begin up to 15 years prior to the clinical diagnosis. So quite a big gap. It has been hypothesized that pathology of PD begins in the peripheral autonomic nervous system or olfactory bulb before it advances into the lower brainstem and substantia nigra. So what are these symptoms? Early stages, which is called as the premotor or the prodromal phase of Parkinson, it may be associated with reduced olfaction, rapid eye movement, sleep behavior disorders, anxiety, depression, orthostatic hypotension, constipation and issues with maturation depending on the region of brain involved. So we might not get direct uh, first-hand acquaintances with these patients with these symptoms, they must be going to some neurologist. But in case we have these minor symptoms or if we have this patient with Parkinson's protocol prescription, we can ask for these symptoms because they may correlate with the premotor phase of Parkinson's disorders. So that is important. Going ahead, uh, they have given about the geographical uh, 
distribution of the disease, not going getting into those details. But as we can see, it's not almost uh, present everywhere. And even in our own country, we are seeing a lot of cases. The age group might be little uh, towards the advanced age, maybe because the diagnosis is delayed. That may also be one of the factors. Because after the age of 60, people, they do are hesitant to visit neurologists for minor complaints. They may think that it is just a routine age-related process. And that is why they may delay the actual diagnosis and exact treatment. Next, this article talk about the environmental influences on B. Parkinson's. And something which is uh, interesting is that Consumption or exposure to particular chemicals like nicotine and caffeine, they are related to Parkinson's, but the relation is little different. It is a negative correlation between tobacco uses and risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So there is a reduced risk of developing Parkinson's disease if somebody is exposed to nicotine. So that is something odd. This is one of the advantages it mentions, but definitely there are a lot of disadvantages to tobacco uses. So we cannot promote tobacco just because it is going to prevent Parkinson's. Caffeine also has shown to have neuroprotective qualities in limited amounts and has been linked to reduce the risk of developing Parkinson's. So these two uh, things which we usually consider as uh, something which can cause obnoxious effects on the health, nicotine, caffeine, they are causing prevention of Parkinson's in some ways. Going ahead into the next part of the article, which is about the neuropathophysiology of the Parkinson's. All of us understand that it is something related to substantia nigra and then something related to the thalamus. But let's just revise once again and exactly understand what the mechanism is quickly. So these are the areas of the brain which are important in the balance between more voluntary movements and involuntary movements. So these areas are caudate nucleus, globus pallidus, butamen, thalamus, subthalamic nucleus, amygdala, and then in the midbrain brainstem, substantia nigra, ventral tegmental area, also nucleus accumbens, olfactory tubercle, and ventral pallidum. So all these areas are the key areas which are going to form a balance between voluntary and involuntary movement. I will just go through these texts and we'll revise the pathophysiology of Parkinson's. Specifically, the substantia nigra, which is split into substantia nigra pars compacta and substantia nigra pars reticularis, then striatum, internus and externus globus pallidus, which is GPI, GPE they have mentioned, thalamus, are involved in limiting unwanted movement and controlling voluntary movement. Although the pathway are utilizing the same region of the brain, the different biochemical reactions involved in direct and indirect paths, which split their function into promoting voluntary and limiting involuntary. So basically, it's a balance inside the brain, which promotes your voluntary movement and limits involuntary jerky movement. For conscious and proprioceptive motions, the Substantia nigra pars compacta excites D1 dopamine receptors in the striatum by releasing dopamine through neuronal projection in the region. So basically the substantia nigra pars compacta will first of all release dopamine and they are that dopamine is going to be received by the D1 receptors in the striatum. Once stimulated, the excitatory glutaminergic D1 receptor Activate the striatum, causing a release of GABA, neurotransmitter GABA, which inhibits the function of globus pallidus internus as well as substantia nigra pars reticularis. With the functionality of these two structures suppressed, they are no longer able to inhibit the ventral, anterior, and lateral thalamic nuclei with their own GABA secretions, meaning the thalamus is then able to use its corticospinal projection to send stimulatory signals to motor cortex and initiate movement. So basically, it's a complex network, which might take a little while to understand, but something important is that substantia nigra pars compacta is really important. It is the one which is going to start everything. It releases dopamine, and that dopamine is going to be received by the D1 receptor in the striatum, which is then going to release GABA and going, getting to inhibit the globus pallidus internus and substantia nigra pars reticularis, 
which are going to get inhibited and then the thalamus can actually start the voluntary movement. So whenever there is an imbalance between this kind of networking, the dopamine receptors, then it leads to all these involuntary movement, tremors, jerky movement, bradykinesia, etc., and the movement spectrum of disorders. So Parkinson's is predominantly characterized by substantially reduced dopaminergic innovation into the nigrostriatal pathway and in other words, a breakdown in the dopamine-mediated connections between the substantia nigra parts compacta in the midbrain to the dorsum, a dorsal striatum in the forebrain. Clinically, this uh, perturbation is responsible for the motor-related symptom associated with Parkinson's. Early on, it can just be a minor frontal cortex atrophy. So this is important for us because we are going to see T1 volumetric images and these conditions of Parkinson's and Parkinsonian syndromes, they may start with minor frontal cortex atrophy, thinning of the substantia nigra pars compacta, and potentially dilatation of the ventricles. So there is going to be atrophy. Age-related atrophy will mask these features in many patients because the age group will be more than 60 most of the time. But disproportionate dilatation of ventricles, disproportionate atrophy of the frontal cortex is important. While quantitation of the atrophy is a relatively simple task using biodata, these minor changes in neuroanatomy are not specific to Parkinson's and therefore not sufficient for diagnostic purposes. So they may just be a soft marker. We can just look for these. Now the article gives us this beautiful table and where it discusses the clinical as well as imaging findings and therapies for all these Parkinsonian syndromes and Parkinson's disease. In the Parkinsonian uh, syndrome spectrum, what all are included is uh, Parkinson's, idiopathic Parkinson's, then progressive supranuclear palsy, multiple system atrophy, MSA, what we call corticobasal degeneration, CBD, and vascular Parkinsonism. So this entire spectrum, it's like a conglomerate of idiopathic Parkinson's, progressive supranuclear palsy, multiple system atrophy, corticobasal degeneration, and vascular Parkinsonism. So let's just quickly go through this table. Idiopathic Parkinson's, the presenting symptoms uh, initially may not be very specific, but uh, if we see MRI, there'll be minor frontal cortex atrophy, ventricular dilatation, and thinning of the substantia nigra pars compacta. PET scan will show asymmetric decreased dopaminergic function slash metabolism in the putamen and increased corded to putamen ratio. DTI and diffusion uh, tensor imaging with diffusion values of fractional anisotropy and also mean diffusivity are important in these uh, case scenarios. So decreased FA values in uh, the substantia nigra, pars compacta, frontal lobes, triatum, cerebellar hemispheres, genu of corpus callosum, hippocampus, dorsomedial thalamus, olfactory cortex is important, and gyrus rectus. So all these are seen with idiopathic Parkinson's. We will see few uh, calculations which we can give in the spectrum of disorders in the second half of this uh, discussion. In PSP, which is your progressive supranuclear palsy, what you're going to see clinically is these do not respond to levodopa. There is slowing of the vertical saccades or supranuclear vertical gaze palsy. This is very, very typical. And if on imaging you think you are going to give a diagnosis of PSP, it will be a good idea to consult the neurologist or actually see the patient yourself and try to assess whether it clinically fits into PSP or not. Because on imaging, labeling PSP, which will declare that the patient will not respond to levodopa. And if the neurologist is not experienced enough to understand that imaging is not the only modality to decide, they may actually stop levodopa. And also, when you are calling a patient as PSP, you are giving them a very uh, limited amount of years in life without the morbidity. And also, we will go through it further that they just worsen in the next four to five years and they have also documented that the life expectancy is as small as seven to eight years after PSP is there in onset. 
So dysarthria, dysphagia, retropulsive pull test is positive. All this is clinically seen in PSP. What we see on MR is the midbrain, frontal predominant, superior cerebellar peduncle atrophy. So midbrain atrophy, frontal atrophy, and superior cerebellar peduncle atrophy. Because of this disproportionate atrophy of these fat segments of the brain, various measurements will get altered, and that is what we can measure on our MRs. Hummingbird sign, Mickey Mouse sign, all these are various uh, ways we are going to name midbrain atrophy in different planes. Thin anterior corpus callosum and hydrocephalus ex vacuo. So we also know that this is something called as the hydrocephalic variant of PSP, which is nothing but a disproportionate dilatation of the ventricles in these cases of PSP. Decreased fractional anisotropy is seen on DPI in the region of midbrain, superior cerebellar peduncle, globus pallida, and caudate nucleus. Whereas there will be increased mean diffusivity in midbrain, basal ganglia, and superior cerebellar peduncles. Coming next to MSA, multiple system atrophy. Again, symptomatically, there will be different long prodromal phase, increased urinary urgency, constipation, postural hypotension, erectile dysfunction. What we are going to see is hot cross bun, the famous sign hot cross bun, which is seen in MSA type C. Or it could be just putamen, pon cerebellar atrophy, iron deposition in putamen, which leads to the T2 hyperintensity. Decreased FA value with increased ADC in putamen, pon cerebellar. In corticobasal uh, degeneration, there will be asymmetric atrophy, parietal lobe atrophy, which is asymmetric. Imaging wise, there will be no major features, but you have to look for this. So something to emphasize at this point of time is that we are talking about different segments of the brain getting atrophied based on the diagnosis. Therefore, it is important to acquire one volumetric T1 sequence so that you can go through the entire brain volume and see whether the atrophy is frontal, parietal, midbrain atrophy, etc. Thinning of corpus callosum is seen in CBD and decreased FA values in corpus callosum, frontal lobes and increased ADC in motor thalamus and pre post central gyrus. In vascular form of Parkinson's, the patient presents with difficulty in standing from chair, uh, hesitation, which is gait freezing and less than 30% they respond to levodopa. T2 uh, flare images on MR will show cotton shape, which is just ill-defined, white matter hyperintensity as it is vascular lateral ventricle enlargement and cortical atrophy. Decreased FA values in frontal lobes, internal capsule, corpus callosum, middle cerebellar peduncle, and decreased mean diffusivity in superior parietal lobe. So most importantly, volumetric T1. Next will be your flare. And as we are seeing here, DTI sequence has role in the spectrum of disorders. Now let us go through each of these in some detail and then see the cases. So Parkinsonian's uh, syndrome, as we know, it is a collection of closely related yet distinct conditions which have different na natural histories, prognosis, and treatment paradigm. The main Parkinsonian syndrome include idiopathic Parkinson's, PSP, MSA, corticobasal degeneration, and vascular Parkinsonism. So with regard to MRI, various combinations, that is DTI, flare, SWI, which is susceptibility weighted images, chemical exchange saturation transfer imaging, and magnetization transfer imaging. These are the spectrum of uh, sequences which we are going to use in these cases of Parkinsonism and Parkinsonian syndromes. DTI is used as an adjunct diagnostic tool in addition to clinical assessment of the presenting motor related symptoms. So, uh, idiopathic Parkinson's, uh, they will have your typical history, but imaging wise, there is not much what we can offer. It is most of the time based upon the clinical paradigms and criteria. There is something called as the Queen Square Brain Bank Diagnostic Criteria for Parkinson's, which is three step process identifying the conditions clinically, excluding non Parkinsonism related conditions that present with similar con uh, symptoms and ensuring the supportive criteria for Parkinson's disease are present, which also serves to eliminate others. What are these? Such as response to levodopa treatment and disease progression. So uh, idiopathic Parkinson's will have a lot of clinical input 
and imaging will play a role to exclude other diagnoses and we will give some subtle findings to support the diagnosis of Parkinson's. Uh, what all we can exclude is also history of CVA is important, traumatic brain injury, normal pressure hydrocephalus, encephalitis, any kind of cerebral neoplasm. All of these can be easily excluded with a good imaging. Now coming next to something which is more towards imaging criteria just rather than being clinical. So that is PSP, MSA, CBD and vascular Parkinson's. What is important in PSP is that despite the fact that the pathophysiology of PSP is similar to idiopathic PD, there are subtle yet important distinction in the physical manifestations, natural history and response to levodopa. And this is important. The response to levodopa is less in PSP or it may not even respond to levodopa at all. There are three main uh, PSP phenotypes. PSP Richardson, PSP Parkinsonism, and PSP pure akinesia with gait freezing. Pathologically, one of the main distinguishing feature is the additional deposition of tangle tau protein. So one thing which we can get from this paragraph is that similar to the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's, where we get these tangle proteins getting deposited in the basal uh, pons, similar to that, in PSP, there is deposition of this insoluble tangle tau protein in the basal pons. So they don't respond to levodopa. The mechanism is different. There will be slowing of the vertical saccades or presence of supranuclear gaze palsy due to atrophy of midbrain and difficulty in controlling the muscle involving swallowing and speaking. Therefore, dysarthria and dysphagia. So if you are giving a diagnosis of PSP, you can better see the patient yourself also at least to find out is there anything related to the supranuclear gaze palsy or dysarthria dysphagia. PSP Richardson is the most common form of PSP and can be distinguished from PD by the presence of cognitive abnormalities such as changes in the personality, issue with memory caused by degradation of the frontotemporal lobe. So they are going to be uh, issues related to cognition and related to the memory. And additionally, although the symptoms of autonomic dysregulation and ataxia of the cerebellum are less common in PSP Richardson, the rapid onset and subsequent neurodegeneration usually result in loss of independence within four years and death within seven years. So it's not a very good kind of a disease in terms of life quality, life expectancy and treatment options. So Whenever you are calling PSP or MSA or something like that, you should be really careful. You can give your uh, all the findings. You can suggest that these may be seen with PSP and some kind of clinical correlation is definitely required. So all the subtypes, be it Richardson or Parkinsonism or the gate freezing variety, they have similar disease duration and symptoms and onset and develop over time to classify them into discrete entities. So as we saw that there is PSP pure akinesia with freezing gait characterized by eventual freezing of the gait caused by the tau pathies. Not going into the clinical details, but two, three things were important. PSP is a different pathophysiology with those tau proteins getting deposited. Uh, they may start with frontotemporal lobe degradation. There may be issues with memory. Uh, classically, there is lack of response to levodopa, slowing of the vertical gaze and also the supranuclear gaze palsy and difficulty in controlling the muscles of swallowing speaking, therefore dysarthria and dysphagia. So this will be the clinical spectrum and imaging wise midbrain atrophy is what we will be looking at. So various measurements and signs around the midbrain atrophy. We will look into the MRPI index and how do we calculate pons to midbrain area ratio, midbrain to pons area ratio, the various kind of measurement. But the basic phenomena will be midbrain specific atrophy and then atrophy of the superior cerebellar peduncles. Next is MSA. The key difference between MSA, Parkinsonism and other Parkinsonian syndrome is the progression over several years from the onset of autonomic symptoms before any movement related findings appear. So here what is more important is the autonomic symptoms. They are the dominant part of the spectrum. 
As a result of the prolonged prodromal phase of MSA Parkinsonism, it is often misdiagnosed as an unrelated urinary or intestinal or cardiac or sleep condition. Clinical feature unique to MSA is the stimulus sensitive myoclonus as opposed to the classic rest tremors. So they are more like intention tremors in MSA as compared to resting tremors in Parkinson's. What are we seeing neuroimaging wise? Neuroimaging features of MSA is the ability to identify the syndrome with T2 weighted images on MR due to the putaminal atrophy. This is what you have to see, putaminal atrophy and an excess of iron deposition in the posterior lateral putamen, creating an area of hyperintensity on T2. Additionally, depending on the nature of the gait disturbance, MSA can be classified as Parkinson's, uh, Parkinsonian or if the patient exhibits truncal ataxia, then fleeing variety. So not going into the clinical classification, but there is one MSA p-type, which is mainly Parkinsonism, uh, Parkinsonism based and uh, dominant. Other is MSA C-type, where we see that hot cross burn, and that is cerebellar phenotype predominant. Now, we just come to the last two entities and then we'll go to the cases, etc. Cortico-basal degeneration and the next one is vascular Parkinsonism. So, cortico-basal degeneration is very unique symptomatically, including asymmetric progressive idiomotor apraxia in the hand. This is quite interesting. We might not as radiologists know all this, but what is it? Inability to perform skill movement on command. So you will command the patient to write. They will fully comprehend the command, but they may not able to actually perform that task. That is inability to perform skilled movement on command. And that is seen with corticobasal degeneration. A kinetic rigid syndrome, slowed movement with muscle stiffness and resistance to physical manipulation, dystonia, rigidity, myoclonus, alien limb syndrome, involuntary purposeless movement, or raising of apraxic limb and sensory, which is cortico sensory syndrome, cortical sensory syndrome, isolated loss of sensation in the apraxic limb. So all this we see with CBD, again, a rare diagnosis to make, but what we see on MR is asymmetric atrophy in the brain hemisphere, specifically the parietal lobes. Vascular form of Parkinson's, uh, we see multiple subcortical white matter lesion. And again, they will not be very responsive to levotopa. So you will have some neurologist telling you do a movement spectrum disorder spectrum uh, protocol or do a Parkinson's protocol. So basic aim is to exclude something really odd like NPH or actual brain tumor lesion. Next part will be to find out Parkinson's plus as we call them or something which is not idiopathic Parkinson's. So PSP, MSA is what we can commonly diagnose with specific features and calculations. Next will be corticobasal degeneration and if clinically relevant, vascular Parkinson's. Just the last part of this article, which talks about the MR approach. So MR approach will consist of the morphologic 3D sequences of flare, T1 being important because you have to assess which area of the brain is atrophic. So routine MR sequence of T1, T2, flare and diffusion are going to be important. Apart from that, there is some utility of DTI and magnetization transfer. So we'll see the cases how T2 helps. So all of this like midbrain atrophy, hot cross burn sign, all of this can be easily seen on your T1 and T2 weighted images. Nothing very uh, drastic or importantly different you require. But Routine imaging with specific interest areas like midbrain, mid-sagittal section, they are going to be important. Susceptibility weighted imaging will be again very, very important to identify these areas of ion deposition. Then magnetization transfer, this is something new. In Parkinson's spectrum of disorders, MT imaging show a decrease in the magnetization transfer in certain areas. So these are all area specific changes due to lower macromolecule concentration in the demyelinated lesion. Similar to that, DTI also, as we know, diffusion tensor imaging has a role in movement spectrum of disorder. In DTI, we basically can see the color maps and also we can calculate few quantitative measures like fractional anisotropy and mean diffusivity. 
And what they have concluded based on the various uh, studies is that in different part of the Parkinson spectrum, the FA values are differently decreased in the areas of brain. So now let's go through this important paragraph and understand. So what you have to do is just perform a DTI sequence first of all and then each Parkinsonian syndrome including PD has unique associated finding that have varying degree of sensitivity and specificity. Decreased FA in caudal region of substantia nigra becomes apparent in early stages of disease development and a sufficient specificity to indicate diagnosis of PD. So actually you can give a diagnostic clue to Parkinson's disorder. Similarly, decreased FA in the midbrain, superior cerebellar peduncle is specific enough to result in a confident PSP diagnosis. So what you are seeing on T2, prior to the morphologic change, the FA changes are apparent. Also, based on sensitivity and specificity alone, MSAP and C can be differentiated from each other and other Parkinsonian syndrome by decreased FA and increased AJC in putamen pons, cerebellum, and MCPs. These are, there are diffusion findings that are potentially pathognomonic of corticobasal degeneration, such as decreased FA and increased ADC in corpus callosum, frontal lobe, white matter, and increased ADC in the motor thalamus, pre slash post central gyrus. So, as you can see, these are quite specific to areas. So, PSP, midbrain, superior cerebellar peduncle, MSA. It is talking about cerebellum, putum and pons, MCPs, corticobasal regeneration. It is seen in frontal lobes, corpus callosum, Parkinson's, caudal area of substantia nigra. So, all these areas, it's a good practice that we start doing DTI in these patients and develop our own experience in this regard. So that was something about DTI. Now let us, I think, go through the cases. Uh, most of the important part of the article we have already seen. Next is talking about uh, the nuclear base scan. So that is mainly the F18 PET, which we can do, neuro PET. And also not only F18 PET, but uh, the dopamine transport receptor scan. So the uh, DOTA test scan, which we do. Uh, they are not always indicated and this table summarizes what we can see on this uh, nuclear scan. So in Parkinson's, on F18 FDG PET, there is increased uptake in striatum thalamus and decreased in temporoparietal cortex. In MSA, there is reduced uptake in the posterior pluton and cerebellum. PSP, there is decreased medial and dorsolateral frontal cortex, cortex thalamus and upper brainstem uptake. And CBD, there is frontoparietal cortex and striatal asymmetric reduction in the uptake. So with this, I think we can go to the end of this article. And I believe uh, that you found it interesting. And now we can go to the cases, which I have put in two slides. And our own way of reporting these Parkinson's spectrum of disorders. So this was the article and we can share the links as well. The entire discussion will be there on YouTube if you want to see sometime again. So review of diagnostic imaging approaches to assessing Parkinson's. So now let's go, go through those small cases and few slides in relation to this Parkinson's disorders. So basically we saw that the spectrum consists of few entities apart from the Parkinson's. So we saw that there are entities like progressive supranuclear palsy. Then we have MSA, which is MSAP, MSAC type, corticobasal regeneration and vascular form of Parkinson's. Imaging modality wise, what we saw that MRI had a lot of facets which we can actually utilize and give a proper clue to diagnosis. Next is nuclear medicine have some specific scans, but CT scan virtually has no role in the spectrum of disorders apart from just basic diagnosis of some other conditions like intracranial space occupying lesions. Even ACR appropriateness criteria wise, Parkinson's and related disorder, MRI is something which is required as a part of your diagnostic workup. What are the imaging protocol? As we saw in the article, the morphologic sequences are important, T2 and flare. If you can do a 3D flare, but what is very important is a T1, which is in 3D. So 3D T1 SPGR, 
or Bravo or MP rage so that you can see uh, and analyze the segmental atrophy in these conditions, which is the most important thing. So always make a point to scroll through the 3D set of images and quantify whether the atrophy is uh, parietal, frontal, whether the atrophy is only up to the midbrain, whether the atrophy is related to cerebellum, everything specific to various kind of conditions. Then uh, susceptibility weighted images will be important. Very thin susceptibility weighted images will be helpful. We'll see how. And additionally, DTI arterial spin labeling, which is perfusion. And in case you find something like NPH, you can do a CSF flow analysis also. So what are the specific areas which we have to cater in the Parkinson protocol of reporting and imaging? So something called as the solo tail sign. Then midbrain will be really important with all these five things based on the midbrain volume reduction. Midbrain contour, midbrain AP distance, midbrain to Pons ratio, Parkinson's index. So as we see, saw on that article thing, midbrain atrophy was specific to PSP, so progressive supranuclear palsy. That is why whenever we are getting clues towards the diagnosis of PSP, all these parameters will become important. So uh, let's go through these cases quickly. Classical Parkinson's, as we saw imaging wise, we might not give much clue, but what we can help them with is exclude other diagnoses and also some subtle findings like frontal atrophy. That is one thing. And something called as the loss of swallow tail. What is this loss of swallow tail? If you see this susceptibility weighted image on the actual section at the level of midbrain, you see that the substantia nigra and the posterior aspect is like a split tail of a bird which is a swallow bird by the name of swallow so here you see there is a tail of that bird is like a split and similar to that is the appearance of this on susceptibility weighted images so just go to the level of midbrain where you see the red nucleus and substantia nigra and then you see this split in the posterior half so that has to be a really high resolution sequence and the spacing has to be less and if you start looking for it, you can easily make sure that a normal versus abnormal can be differentiated. So you can call it definitely normal. You can call it probably normal. You can call it probably abnormal and you can have definite abnormal. So because of the change and deposition of iron in these areas of substantia nigra, in cases of Parkinson, there is blurring of the posterior margin of the substantia nigra, which leads to loss of this split appearance, what we saw. So this is definitely abnormal. So a definitely and probably abnormal ones are quite correlative to Parkinson's spectrum of disorder. So just to revise, you can easily get it online as well. So loss of swallow tail, you can have definitely normal, which is a normal person. Probably where this, there is mild blurring, probably abnormal is quite a blurring, but you might not see that very confidently, but here it is completely lost. So definitely abnormal. Next, uh, what we saw was uh, the extra Parkinson's, that is PSP, MSA types, and vascular Parkinsonism and CPD. So MSA as also is known as side dagger, dragger syndrome, and it can be C, which is cerebellar variety, or P, which is Parkinsonism variety of, with putamillar involvement per se. So MSSC will have cerebellar atrophy, which will be one of the findings. And next will be your atrophy of the middle cerebellar peduncles. And then this hot cross, typical hot cross bun on axial flare or T2 weighted sequence, which you can see. And also, if you see on the uh, neuropet or the perfusion brain imaging, there will be reduction in the perfusion in cerebellum and middle cerebellar peduncles. In MSAP type, there will be reduced signal and disproportionate atrophy in putamen. So it is mainly P for putamen. It's basically P is for Parkinsonism, but you can remember it as predominantly putamen involving. So on gradient and T2, there will be relative uh, hyperintensity in the region of putamen in globus pallidus and red nucleus comparison and peripheral slit sign that is surrounding the putamen, a slit of 
T2 hyper intensity. So this is what is a peripheral slit and they will be disproportionate putaminal atrophy in these cases. And this is a hypo intensity on swan and T2 weighted images. Same thing with hypoperfusion on neuropet and also on arterial spin labeling. PSP, the one which is midbrain predominant and the, the most important thing to remember is midbrain atrophy. Rest everything is because of the midbrain atrophy. So on mid-sagittal section, you will see that the upper convex margin of the midbrain is lost to flattening of the seam. The pons will appear quite a prominent structure with small midbrain overlying it. So this is what we call as the hummingbird sign because it gives an appearance of beak of a hummingbird because of the flattening or concavity and atrophy of the midbrain. If you calculate the ratio of midbrain to pons area, there will be reduction in the ratio in the cases of PSP, again because of midbrain atrophy. If you see this on axial, you will see that morning glory sign or Mickey Mouse sign because of the atrophy, it looks as if the ventral portions are fanning out and the mid portion is like narrowed. So this is the morning glory sign. And then is the other important measurement which we see in PSP, which is MRPI, that is MR Parkinson's index. So you require to measure four things into it. One is your midbrain area. Second is pons area. Next two things which you are going to measure is on coronal plane, you have to measure the diameter of the superior cerebellar peduncle and on sagittal, you have to measure the dimension of the middle cerebellar peduncle. Once you have done with these four things, that is your midbrain area, pons area, dimension of the MCP and dimension of the superior cerebellar peduncle, you have to calculate the MRPI as pons by midbrain into MCP by SCP. Normal values are below 13.5. Values above that is more specific to the diagnosis of PSP. You can also measure the AP diameter of PSP, which normally should be more than 12 millimeters. There are articles which measure it like this on mid uh, sections, mid level, but most of them, they are uh, telling us that you have to measure in midline AP dimension. Now we also have MRPI 2.0 in 2018. It has been introduced and what has been accommodated is the ventricle width. So, so that is the width of the third ventricle and also the complete frontal on width. So what you have to do is uh, you have to calculate from MRPI 1, you have to multiply it that by V3 divided by the frontal horn, not this line, but the frontal horn width. And those values of more than 2.18 can differentiate PSP from PD. So what you have to do is, again, I will just revise. For MRPI 1, what you are doing, midbrain area, pons area, sagittal section for the middle cerebellar peduncle and coronal section for the superior cerebellar peduncle. Once you have taken all these four measurements, which can be done on any routine T1 or T2 weighted sequence, if you acquire in 3D plane, you can reconstruct and get all these. Then pons divided by midbrain into MCP divided by SCP. That is your MRPI. That same MRPI, what you got, you have to multiply it by the ratio of width of the third ventricle by width of the frontal horn. So not this line, but something from here to here. Then coming to the corticobasal degeneration, we have already seen it through the article that there are features which will be specific to it and imaging wise, there will be asymmetrical frontoparietal atrophy. Alien limb phenomena is seen with corticobasal degeneration. There will be atrophy of the basal ganglia and disproportionate atrophy of the frontoparietal lobes. Specifically, that is asymmetric also. So sidewise asymmetric and disproportionate to parietal and frontal lobes. So that is uh, what we see in corticobasal degeneration, not going through ALS. And we have already seen about uh, the advanced sequences like DTI through that article. But also there are a lot of AI-based tools available, which gives us the segmented brain volumes very easily. So you have to just upload your 3D T1 sequence. They can just link it through the packs also. They charge you per patient wise, or they have some kind of packages. And immediately, say within 10 minutes to 20 minutes time, they give you this report. 
so it saves a lot of time of the radiologist otherwise they will be spending hours to calculate these small 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 volumes if somebody asks for also it removes the subjectivity from the measurement so if somebody who is experienced versus a new radiologist and your reports will be becoming more and more robust and you can also compare these values when the patient comes for follow up so that is why these tools are really uh, useful to us in case you can uh, try using one of these for the segmented brain volumes and also uh, the nuclear scans some examples so a symmetrical uptake of the dopamine transporters in parkinsons which we see in the dota red scan uh, dopa pet ct decreased physiologic uptake again in this basal ganglia region and there is something called as neuromelanin weighted mri which is uh, not very uh, frequently used this is something upcoming and that can also give you specific idea about the neuromelanin part on the mr images and how do we put everything together we give a table sort of and we call it uh, more towards mid brain measurement so upper mid brain profile ap diameter of mid brain mid brain to pons area ratio and mrpi all of these are more specific as we understand now towards the diagnosis of psp and if you are putting a diagnosis of psp make a point to correlate with the clinical findings and not just label it based on imaging as we saw the prognosis is guarded and they will not respond to levodopa so it's better to correlate with the neurophysician's finding or yourself also see for dysarthria dysphagia supranuclear gaze palsy like symptoms etc and then give a possibility and they can just correlate with it so to summarize the article as well as what we saw there are many imaging features that can help us identify parkinson spectrum of disorders and which includes idiopathic parkinson's psp msa cbd and vascular parkinson's mri is the modality of choice there are ratios and measurements which will help us to come to a conclusion and ai based tools to aid and also to help us save our time and give a robust diagnosis so with this uh, i come to an end of today's uh, article review journal club which was on movement spectrum of disorder and imaging approach to it i hope this was helpful and if there are any questions we can take up those in the chat box and uh, as mentioned we have this every month so please do join us and the next month will be on parathyroid 4d ct by dr rachna borkar and august we'll be seeing advanced in body related which is pancreatic tumor basically by dr amit choudhury so thank you all once again for joining and if you have any questions we can discuss the same complete discussion will be on our youtube channel these are our upcoming master classes which are going to be on uh, one is june 18 which you saw that is ongoing and august 20th will be hepatobiliary imaging and it will be completely one day online thing dedicated to hepatobiliary topics and september 17th is onco imaging update and we are also coming up with the international edition of the MRI teaching course we had our on site in uh, edition may end of this year and now this will be november 3rd 4th 5th this is completely online so you can definitely attend these at your ease and the speakers will be all international speakers which we missed in the on site conference and topics will be all advanced mr related topics so thank you all and with this i think we can come to an end of today's journal club sessions thank you so much madam that was made very easy should i start thank you abhishek so i'll yeah yeah we can end it yeah